The following program is being presented to you by a community producer. The statements, views, and opinions expressed are not necessarily those of ALC-TV or the City of Avon Lake. Welcome to Common Sense. Uh, the Common Sense program is a uh, series of shows uh, that uh, uh, are interviews with interesting people so that we can learn in a clear, concise, and direct way who these folks are, uh, what they do, and uh, what makes sense to them and what doesn't. Uh, I'm Rudy Breglia, and today I'll be interviewing uh, Dr. Jason Stevens, uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science at uh, Ashland University and co-director of the Ashbrook uh, Scholar Program. Jason, welcome to Common Sense. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Okay, well that's great. Uh, uh, why don't you start us off and uh, tell us where you were born, where you've lived, that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Sure, I, I was born right here in Ohio, okay. uh, a little south of here in a town called Maslin, Ohio. I, okay. I grew up here. Uh, I actually went to Ashland University for my undergraduate wow. degree, where okay. I, I now work. Uh, I was there and, and got my BA and went on uh, to Dallas. I studied at the University of Dallas, okay. uh, received my master's and PhD uh, there. Uh, and then once I finished that up, I, I came on back home. I was okay. lucky enough to, to land a job at Ashland. Um, right. Apparently, I, I right, had, had not up, upset the wrong people when I was there the first time, so they okay. invited me back. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and I, uh, I have lived and worked in, in Ashland ever since. Okay. I, I liked you, uh, the way you use that word, home. You came home. Okay. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. Uh, why did uh, you uh, choose an academic career? Oh, that's a good question, right? What's the old saying? Those who can't do teach. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't ascribe to that. Okay. Uh, so the, the the reason why I settled on the academic career was actually it was, it was a very late decision. I went into college not knowing what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I I might want to go into theater and be an actor. So I, I had minored in theater originally. Um, I was interested in politics, but I I thought I was much more interested in sort of the campaigns and the, the elections, the much more practical uh, side. I, I was also interested in, in possibly going to, to law school. Okay. Um, and so for the first several years of college, I sort of ended up realizing all of those other things. I was like, I don't think I want to do that. Like I studied okay. theater for a year. I'm like, well, I good. don't think I want to do that. I sat in on a law school class. I was like, wow, this isn't what I thought it was. Um, maybe I don't want to do that. I started working on a lot of campaigns and, and elections while I was in undergrad, and I realized, boy, I really don't like waking up on Saturday mornings and go knocking door to door and waking people up, and uh, maybe, I, maybe that's not for me. It, it wasn't until really my senior year that as, as a result of all of the classes I took at Ashland, I realized I was happiest doing what I was doing in the classroom as a student. Okay. And so I realized, why not just continue and be a, a student for life. Okay. Uh, which is really what right, academics, I think, strive to be. That, there you go. Uh, did you have a role model in any of this? Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. So um, my professors were my role models, uh, okay. especially uh, a gentleman uh, called Peter W. Schramm, uh, okay. who he didn't found the Ashbrook Center, uh, but he helped turn it into what it is today. Okay. And so to, to borrow a, a Lincoln phrase, Peter was my beau ideal of a teacher. Okay. Um, watching him in the classroom, um, right, he was a master teacher. He, he knew his subject. He loved his subject. He loved teaching students. Um, he would do a, right, a thing the students came to call shrambling, where he would start off with a text, but then just start talking about it with the students. And who knows, you know, who knew where the conversation could go from there. Um, but he was, the, he was the first teacher I ever had who, when you saw him in the classroom, you actually saw a man thinking. Okay. Like thinking in action instead of right coming in with a prepared lecture or notes. Okay. He was sort of doing the hard work right there in front of you. 
Uh, and it's because of classes with him and, and, and others in the Ashbrook program when I was there that, um, right, that's how I decided, I, when I decided I wanted to be a teacher and they uh, provided an excellent example uh, of what a good teacher looks like. Okay, well that, that's wonderful. Uh, what are the res major responsibilities of a, of a professor? Oh goodness, well I will say the only part of my job that actually feels like work okay. is the grading. The rest of it is all, is, is all, I just enjoy it so much. It's, 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 it's pleasurable, but it's serious. It's what the Greeks called leisure. So today we think of leisure as like another form of play or another form of goofing recreation, off, goofing uh, off. That's not how like the ancients thought about leisure. The Greek word for leisure is actually skule, which is where of course we get the word school from. School is meant to be leisure, meaning it's, it's supposed to be serious, but also pleasurable. And that's what the activity of thinking and reading these great books and studying the great minds of the past, that's the effect it, it should have on us. When we read Lincoln and realize, oh my gosh, I'm reading and understanding Lincoln. It's like I'm having a conversation with this guy. I'm having a conversation with the past. Our schools today don't seem like they're, they're doing a lot of, of that. I'm, I'm sure a lot of students mm -hmm. would be surprised to hear me say that school ought to be leisure. Right? They may respond, and I've seen them respond by saying, no, school is more like work. <laughs> it shouldn't be. No, it should be no. enjoyable. It Understand. should be pleasurable. It should be fun. Okay. What best prepared you for being a professor? Seeing it done by others. Okay. Yeah, having those role models in my life. Um, because I never took a class on right, how to teach. Um, all the... You know, all the great businessmen I know, they didn't study business in undergrad. Um, all the great leaders in American history and yeah. world history, I guarantee you, George Washington never took a class on leadership studies, <laughs> right? So to be could a, have taught it. Huh? Right, exactly. He could have. Yeah. So I think today, um, right, the, the, um, the schools of education are fixated for good reasons, I, I think, on how to teach. Um, but there should be more emphasis on what you're teaching. So all the great teachers I know, right, they didn't take any classes on, on how to teach. They, they were in classrooms with, with great teachers and, and through time and experience, uh, they become better teachers. And it, it, it takes time, it certainly does. Um, but if, if you, uh, some of us, uh, right, those who are the best teachers, they have that sort of natural inclination to wanting to, to help students learn. What's the most surprising aspect of being a professor that you run across? Oh my goodness, that is a good question. Yeah, the most surprising aspect of being a, a teacher. I, I will say um, that I love teaching. I think a great teacher, they all have three things in common. They, they love their subject, mm -hmm. they know their subject, and they love teaching students. Um, for me, the most surprising thing has always been um, that I never get tired of it, right? So some people have asked me like, well, don't you get tired of teaching the same thing year after year? And the, the, the students come through, then they graduate, then you get a whole you new, know, crop. That new crop and you got to start all over. Um, I, always, I always say, or I try to look at it this way, I never get tired of seeing students get it. Like when they have that light yeah. bulb moment, right? And you could tell. You could tell, you could see that on their faces. That, that never gets old. Understand. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the Ashbrook uh, Center and how it's related to a Ashland University. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So uh, the Ashbrook Center is an independent, nonprofit uh, educational institution located uh, on the campus of Ashland University uh -huh. right here in, in Ashland, Ohio. Um, although it's located on Ashland's university campus, right, it's, it's governed by its own board, it has its own budget, even though it's located on campus, its work, its mission really, right, is nationwide. Many of our programs for students, uh, teachers, and citizens, right, they take uh, Ashbrook right, throughout the country to all 50 states and, right, even in some cases uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the mission statement for uh, uh, the uh uh, Ashbrook. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I love the mission of, of the Ashbrook Center. 
Um, the mission, it hasn't changed much since the institution was founded back in 1983 mm -hmm. um, by President Ronald Reagan. In fact, we just right last year celebrated our, our 40th anniversary. The mission statement of Ashbrook is this. The Ashbrook Center seeks to strengthen constitutional self-government by educating all of our fellow Americans, students, teachers, and citizens in the history and the founding principles of our country and the habits of reflection and choice necessary to perpetuate our republic. In other words, the mission of the Ashbrook Center is this. We're, we're trying to save the country. Okay. Ronald Reagan said that freedom is only one generation away from extinction, that the principles of the American regime, because they don't get passed down through the bloodline, they actually have to be taught to each new generation. That means that teachers, excellent teachers, are more necessary now than ever before to help teach the history and founding principles of our country uh, to the next generation. And I, I think that um, it, you know, if, you, if you asked uh, the ordinary man or the ordinary woman on the street, right, they would probably think that right, that education is, is really important and that we're in danger today of losing it, which is why the, the work, the mission of the Ashbrook Center uh, has never been more important. Understand. Uh, tell us about the undergraduate uh, Ashbrook uh, Scholar Program. Yes, yeah, so I am uh, one of four co-directors of the Ashbrook uh, Scholar mm -hmm. Program. Um, so the Ashbrook Scholar Program, uh, it's an organization that goes all the way back to the, the founding of the Ashbrook Center. Uh, it's work done with our undergraduate um, college students. Uh, so we just welcomed in a freshman class of Ashbrook Scholars. There's about uh, 80 of them in our okay. freshman class. Right, nearly 200 overall. This was our largest class uh, ever. We keep growing. Um, and the, the purpose of the Ashbrook Scholar Program is, well, there's a lot I could say about it. Um, I think that the overall purpose is to, again, going back to that mission statement of the Ashbrook Center, to, to educate this next round of citizens, this new generation of citizens in the history and founding principles of their country. And so what we do is we sit around and we read old books. We read great founding era documents from, right, the, who we, we affectionately call the founders. We call them, and this is coming from Peter, uh, Tommy J and the boys. I see. Yeah, those are the founding fathers. So we read Jefferson. We read Hamilton. We read Washington. We read Adams and, and Franklin and the other worthies. And we spend time with them. And we make them our friends. We read the original primary sources um, and at the end of four years in the Ashbrook Scholar Program, every Ashbrook Scholar comes out of this program knowing how to read well, how to think well, how to speak well, how to write well, and how to listen well. They all come out knowing those five things. And right, they always worry about a job, but I tell them, don't worry about that. The job will take care of themselves itself because if you can come out of this program knowing how to do those five things well, any employer worth yeah. his salt is going to be interested in somebody who can do those, those five things. And so the Ashbrook Scholar Program, what it really is, um, is a community of friends, of like-minded individuals. And when I say like-minded, I don't mean that they all share the same opinions. In fact, they don't, right? Many of them right, are, have very different opinions, okay. right? They're right, left, center, right? We have the college Republicans. We have the college Democrats. We have... Uh, the libertarian group, right? The, the Young Americans for Liberty. So they don't always agree. They don't always see to eye to eye. But in all of our classes, we focus on conversation. Okay. So they participate in, in civil discourse with one another. If somebody disagrees with another, they talk about that. They always do so in a respectful way. And we, we require that. Okay. They, they, and they get used to, they get in the habit of having these respectful civil conversations with those whom they disagree with. And I think that, especially given the state of the country today, we need more of that sort of thing than ever before. And that's, that's what the Ashbrook Scholar Program 
is teaching the next generation of American citizens. Okay, I, 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 my next question was, tell us about the teaching or educational approach used by Ashbrook, and you've kind of gone through that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <clears throat> I will say just because I get, that's such an important point because okay. it's the, the approach of Ashbrook is unique. It's different than most other, than any other institution really out there for two reasons that I mentioned, but maybe it might be worth repeating. Just Go ahead. Yeah, so first we focus on the original primary sources. Ashbrook, we don't use, right, we don't use textbooks. Um, we don't use uh, lectures. We focus on those original primary documents. And by focusing on those documents, instead of, say, a textbook, you're getting the unvarnished opinion, yeah. truth, right? As opposed to a textbook where you're getting the opinion of some professor telling you how to think about Thomas Jefferson, we say, let's just go straight to the horse's mouth and let's just read Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Let's see what he has to say for himself. So we allow the documents to speak for themselves. And so we focus on those primary documents, but the second thing we do is then we have a conversation. We have conversations, the students have conversations with each other in the classroom and there's a conversation that develops between the, the professor and the student because again, the the teachers, we don't give lectures. We don't come in prepared with right, any notes. It's um, <clears throat> much more organic in that okay. way. It's much more conversational, a lot like what you and I are doing here. Right now, yeah. Um, and we, but we also have that conversation with the past, with these great minds of the past, like, like Jefferson and, and Lincoln. Um, what was that movie that came out right, 20 plus years ago, um, The I See Dead People? Um, yeah, I, the sixth sense. Yeah, right, right? right. See, at Ashbrook, we talk to dead people. We talk to <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. We talk to Alexander Hamilton. We talk to these great minds of the past, and we actually have a conversation with them. If you ask them questions, and if you you're sort of keep asking and asking the right way, and keep thinking and keep listening and keep um, reading, they'll answer you. Right. So you'll you understand where they are. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, right, we think that um, this, is a, this is a good thing for the students to, to understand and, and appreciate. And in order to, to do that, right, they take their classes together. So their freshman year, they all take two classes together, one in the spring, one in the fall and one in the spring, one class called Understanding Politics and another class called Democracy in America. They take history classes together. They take a senior capstone class together their senior year. Uh, that we call human being and citizen. Uh, and then their senior year, they're all required to write and publicly defend uh, a senior thesis, okay. which is on some topic of interest to them. And they spend, right, a year and a half, two years reading, thinking, writing, talking about this subject. And then at the conclusion of their four years, um, they publicly defend a, a senior thesis, which in many, many cases, most of them, in fact, um, these are high quality, these are master's level thesis, theses in many cases. Okay. And so that's, that's the culmination of their four years of study then uh, at Ashbrook. Un understand. Uh, tell us about the Summer Ashbrook uh, Academy program. Yes, so the Ashbrook Academy, this is another way that we have right, extended our, our mission. Okay. Reaching not just uh, college students, but also high school students. So the Ashbrook Academies, they started back in 2015. Um, and today we have right, several Ashbrook Academies that are designed especially for rising seniors and rising juniors at the high school level. So during the summer for a whole week, uh, high school students come to Ashland University's campus they live in the dorms, they eat the food, they okay. go to class, they get the college experience. Um, and for a whole week, they are in the classroom with Ashton University faculty, like myself, uh, studying Ameri the principles of American history and government. So we have uh, week-long academies that we, on, we, call, we call one, our flagship academy, we call it Telling America's Story, where they study the Declaration of Independence the Gettysburg Address, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Three I very see. important documents when it comes to understanding America. We have an academy on Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. We have one on capitalism versus socialism, a really popular one. 
Uh, we have one on politics and literature. We have another on the Supreme Court and the Constitution. Those students who may be interested in, in one day going to law school okay. right, tend to gravitate towards that program. Um, we have another one on World War II. Uh, and then we have other academies as well that aren't just in history and politics. If that's not your game, if you're more interested in, I don't know, the, the, the natural sciences we, or psychology uh, or religion, we have academies on those subjects as well. Uh, the Bible and the human condition. Uh, we have one on uh, CSI, another one on the psychology of good and evil, another one um, on right, how to get rich. Uh, right, so maybe those who are interested in, in the study <laughs> in the study of business, um, and another one on uh, utopias and dystopias in film and literature. So really, there's an academy for anything that might pique your interest, right? And and these again are, are specifically designed for high schoolers, and they get college credit at the end of it. And so it's it's really oh, it's a way. Great. Yes, right. Yeah, they love it, and we love it too. Okay, uh, tell us about uh, uh, teaching American history program. Yeah, so t Teaching American History, um, first of all, it, there's a website, teachingamericanhistory.org or simply tah.org. The website itself is the largest online database of original primary sources in the study of American history and government that's specifically designed for teachers. Um, teachers out there who um, right, work in the classroom, especially in history and politics, have probably used this site, even if they don't know who we are, um, because we have this uh, document database of just tens of thousands of documents uh, right at your fingertips in the study of American history and government. Um, but teaching American history is much more than just a website. Right? It's also, it's also a, uh, as you say, a program or, or even, right, I, I'm, I'd like to call it a, a state of mind because teaching American history, it's an offshoot of the Ashbrook Center, uh, but its purpose is to reach teachers across the country. Okay. So in the same way the Ashbrook Academies and the Ashbrook Scholar Program are aimed at students, teaching American history is aimed at current and prospective teachers working in the classroom. So the programs that go into teaching American history, um, we have one-day seminars, right? We do you know, 200 one-day seminars throughout the country every year. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna be in Dallas, Texas uh, next Monday doing a, a one-day seminar on slavery and the Constitution. And at these seminars, there are three 90-minute sessions where you have a faculty leader and a group of teachers sitting around a table, reading the original primary documents and having a conversation about those documents on a variety of topics in American history and government. So those are our one-day seminars. Uh, we also have multi-day seminars, which basically it's just like a one day. It's only over right, three days instead of one. And those take place uh, at a historic site. So we might have right, a multi-day seminar at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello wow. or James Madison's Montpelier or uh, right, the, the National Spy Museum, um, or the, the Ronald Reagan Ranch out in, in California. And so you're there not just studying history, but you're living it as well, right? You're, you're in that historic place. Uh, Teaching American History also has a master's program, uh, the only master's program of its kind that's designed around this, the hardworking schedules of working teachers today. Uh, we call it our, our MAG program. It's the Masters of Arts in American History and Government program. So that's the master's program that we have for teachers where, again, we come together um, both um, online and on campus in order to read and study together the great founding text of American history uh, and government. And you can, um, right, many, many teachers have gone through and gotten their, their master's degree since we started the MAG back in 2005. And it's really a, a, a great master's program. There's nothing like it out there for teachers, especially who are interested in beefing up their content, not necessarily right. focusing on how to teach the pedagogy aspect of it, but on the content on, on, on what to teach. And to help them do that, we Finally, also have, um, this is part of Teaching American History, and it's available on tah.org. We have what we call our Core Documents Collection, right, which is a series. There are dozens of volumes on precise topics in American history and government that 
uh, an expert faculty leader has, right, they've edited a volume that brings together the original primary sources on that specific topic. So the Civil War, the American founding, World War II, federalism, separation of powers, the Supreme Court, we got dozens of them where you have the original primary documents with an introduction written by a faculty uh, expert, uh, as well as study questions, guiding questions to help students and citizens learn about this great past of ours. Um, and those are all available online. You can download uh, a free PDF copy of them, or right, you can order hard copies, and they, those are available at cost on our Teaching American History org website um, and and by the way those those editors of those volumes are are faculty members those who teach our one days who teach those multi days who teach in our master's program and who help us develop the core document collection those are great teachers and they come not just from Ashland but from across the country our master's faculty network extends to dozens of schools throughout the nation and brings together these great minds who, again, have the same approach to education that, that Ashbrook has, has spearheaded, right? The focus on primary documents and right through the means of, of conversation. So we have great teachers teaching all of these programs, not just from right here in little old Ashland, but from throughout the country, right? From West Point, right? We've got a, a great teacher uh -huh. from West Point who teaches in our programs and right dozens of other schools. And so you're not just getting sort of the the local Ashland flavor, right? But you're, you're getting the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, understand. Uh, what is the um, uh, major issues lecture series? Yeah, so the Mills luncheons, yeah, the major issues lecture series, um, that has been a part of Ashbrook's tradition since the beginning, since 1983, uh, when Ronald Reagan um, inaugurated the center. Um, the Mills lecture series, we have about two or three of them every semester where we bring um, usually um, uh, you know, uh, popular political leaders or news personalities to Ashland University's campus to give a talk for the community and the Ashbrook scholars. Um, so for instance, this semester we are bringing uh, Congressman Jim Jordan okay. uh, and former Ohio State football coach Jim Tressel to Ashland University's okay. campus. Uh, and they're going to be uh, giving a, a, a talk um, right during lunch uh, to uh, members of the community, to our Ashbrook scholars. And that is, uh, that's a way of, of helping the, the, the center fundraise. Uh, and it's also a way for the center though, more importantly, to reach the community. So those here in Ohio who maybe haven't heard of the Ashbrook Center before, are interested, uh -huh. may be interested uh, in attending um, one or more of, of those events. Uh, and more information about those can be found on Ashbrook's website, uh, ashbrook.org. Okay. Uh, tell us about the uh, AmericanFounding.org uh, website. So in addition to the TeachingAmericanHistory.org website, we have AmericanFounding.org. We love American history. We love studying the original primary documents. And so AmericanFounding.org, um, it is the largest online collection of, of documents and debates from the founding, right? specifically designed to be accessible for teachers, students, and citizens. Um, AmericanFounding.org, it is um, the result of a, a lot of great minds have, have contributed to this. Uh, but first and foremost was a gentleman and a scholar named uh, Gordon Lloyd, uh, who just unfortunately recently passed away. But this was in many ways his legacy. Um, Gordon, uh, he forgot more about the Constitutional <laughs> Convention than I will ever know in my life. He was a master. He was an expert. Um, and he was a great friend of the Ashbrook Center as well. And so he, along with some others, uh, Christopher Burkett, a colleague of mine, also helped uh, you know, work on this website and, and put the thing together and launch it. Um, you really should check it out. I mean, the way Gordon thought about and taught uh, the American founding, especially the Constitutional Convention, um, is all there on the website, right, for people to read, love, and enjoy. Okay. Well, let me change gears on you a mm -hmm. little bit. What was Lincoln hoping to do with his Gettysburg Address? Oh, wow. So we've been talking about original primary documents. Now we're gonna now we're gonna get into the into the weeds a bit. I love okay. it. This is great. Okay. Um, so every Ashbrook scholar reads the Gettysburg Address. Okay. 
And typically, even during their Ashbrook Scholar interview, we will have them read that address or some other document in American history and government, have them read that address out loud. Um, we do that for several reasons. We think that right, reading out loud is a sort of lost art. Um, we don't read out loud a lot anymore. We tend to read silently to ourselves. And, and as a result, we tend to miss things, right? especially in a speech like the Gettysburg Address that was designed to be read out loud. Right? It was, it was an address, after all. It was a speech that Lincoln yep, actually right. gave and delivered uh, at Gettysburg National Cemetery uh, back in November of, of 1863 following the Battle of Gettysburg that took place there the previous July, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, of course, in 1863. We read the Gettysburg Address for several reasons, but one of which is we're, we're trying to have that conversation with Lincoln, and we try to ask him this question. Mr. Lincoln, what was the Civil War about? Why are we fighting it? What, what is, what is, what's going on here? Why is this worth fighting for? Now, if you ask your textbooks, your textbooks might tell you the purpose of the war from Lincoln's perspective was to save the Union or to right, eventually abolish slavery. Those perspectives aren't necessarily wrong, but they're incomplete because that's not actually what Lincoln says or doesn't say that in so many words in the Gettysburg Address. Right? So for instance, he never uses the word union in the Gettysburg Address. He speaks of the nation. Uh -huh. And when we have students read the Gettysburg Address out loud, they, they find that there's, there's a, a kind of poetry to it. Right, it's in okay. iambic pentameter, um, 272 words. There's this rhythm and cadence, four score and seven years ago. Okay. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And when the students read the speech out loud, they may not be used to reading out loud and they may stumble or, or skip over the words a bit. But I'll tell you this, 99 times out of 100, they all s skip over or they, they stumble over one particular section of the speech. Okay. And it's in the second paragraph where Lincoln says, right, now, now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. Students always stumble over the double that's, yeah. that that nation might, because that doesn't sound as poetic as the rest of the speech. It sounds weird and odd and awkward. It's like, Mr. Lincoln, what were you thinking? Why didn't you say that the nation might live or yeah. that their, or this nation might live? It turns out the double that's, I think Lincoln's trying to get us to stumble. He's trying to get us to stop and catch ourselves. And, attention. Yeah, he's trying to get our attention, exactly. And well, then what's he trying to draw our attention to? What is that nation that we're trying to save? That those who struggled here gave their lives that that nation might live. What nation is that nation? Well, it turns out it goes back to the, the nation he had talked about in the first paragraph, that nation that was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. That happened four score and seven years ago, which of course right, is 1776. Lincoln's pointing us back to the founding, back specifically to the declaration and that nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. It's that nation that those who here gave their lives, they died that that nation might live, the nation of the founding fathers, right? That nation that was conceived in 1776 to bring that forth in what the third paragraph refers to as a, a new birth of freedom, to save that nation, the nation of our fathers, the one that was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. It's that nation that the soldiers here at Gettysburg die to save. And then, so we just, we just asked Mr. Lincoln a question, right? Mr. Lincoln, what's the purpose of the Civil War? And in the double that's and that portion that we always stumble over, he just answered it. He answered that question. What's the uh -huh. purpose of the Civil War? Not necessarily to save the Union. That's not incorrect. It's just incomplete. The purpose is that that nation, 
the one conceived in 1776 and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, that that nation might live. Then we follow that up when we work with the students. We ask them, oh, okay, who do you think then is buried in that cemetery? Right? At Gettysburg National Cemetery, and sometimes their eyes get wide. They're like, what does that have to do with anything? I never thought about that before. I've never even been there before. Let me pull out my phone, and I'm going to ask Mr. Google. Right? I don't need you, like, you know, professor. I'll just ask Mr. Google or Siri or Alexa or whichever one they're using. Who's buried in uh, Gettysburg National Cemetery? Right? Is it just Union soldiers, or is it Union and Confederate? And we tell them, hey, put the phone away. Instead of asking Mr. Google, let's ask Mr. Lincoln. Let's ask Mr. Lincoln in his Gettysburg address and say, Mr. Lincoln, who's buried in that cemetery? Because he just told us in the double bats, right? We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. Who died that that nation might live? Again, that nation is the nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Who died for the proposition that all men are created equal? It wasn't the Southerners, right? They were fighting, right, for principles other than equality. There's no doubt about that, mm -hmm. um, right? Ask Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy in his cornerstone speech where he says, this whole war is being fought over the great principle that all men are created unequal. It's only the Union soldiers, and this is again Lincoln yeah. saying, it's only the Union soldiers who died that that nation might live. So only Union soldiers are buried there in Gettysburg National Cemetery because only they died that that nation might live. And now all of a sudden we've answered the question, who's buried in that cemetery? And we didn't have to look it up online. We didn't have to ask Mr. Google. We asked Mr. Lincoln. And all of a sudden, they go, oh, my gosh, I didn't see that before, but I get it now. Right? This is part of that conversation with the past that we think we can have. We can ask Mr. Lincoln questions, and he answers us. The past is still speaking today through these documents. Yeah. Uh, what are the founding principles of self-government? If you want to know the founding principles of self-government, I would start with the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Declaration which emphasizes liberty and equality, um, the Declaration which lists in the second paragraph several certain self-evident truths that we as Americans, we claim to hold to. Uh, if you notice, right, if you look at the second paragraph of the, the Declaration of Independence, there are five different that statements that we claim to hold as self-evident, when uh, Jefferson says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right, what self-evident truths do we hold to? What are our principles? That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, and five, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. And the first of those five principles, I think the greatest of those five, is the first, that all men are created equal. All human beings are created equal, not in terms of Right? Their talents or their wealth or their virtue or their beauty or their size, their color, their sex, their education, their background. Um, all human beings are created equal, as the Declaration goes on to say, with certain unalienable rights. You as a human being, you have certain rights that cannot be separated from, from you. Those rights are inherent. They're essential. They don't come from the political community in which you live. They're not a result of government, right? Government, they don't give you these rights. These rights come from, as the first paragraph says, the laws of God and nature, right? You have these rights because they are a gift to you from your creator, the Declaration says. And if your rights don't come from governments, but they come from your creator, 
That also means, we try to get the students to see this, that also means if those rights aren't given from, by government, then they can't be taken away from government either. And that is right, so important when it comes to understanding the relationship right, between right, citizens and the regime, between right, human beings and, and, and government. Your rights are not the gifts of governments or, or potentates. Um, but they are blessings from, from God, from the laws of, of God and nature. And therefore, that gives us some understanding, some standard for understanding justice, for discerning between just and unjust laws, between right and wrong action, because the Declaration provides this, this standard for thinking about, about justice, for thinking about our rights. And I, I think that is something that today, especially this country, we we sorely need, and especially the next generation needs to be educated in what are those rights? Where do they come from? Um, what are our duties and responsibilities as, as citizens? Um, these are not new questions. These are very old questions that great minds have thought a lot about. And so we just put those great minds in front of the students because when you've got the Declaration of Independence there, same thing with the Gettysburg Address in Lincoln. When you put the Declaration of Independence in front of a student, you've got a piece of Jefferson's mind in front of you. You've got a piece of his soul, actually, in that document. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of poke and prod it and, and ask it questions and, and learn from it. Because I, I know that right, Lincoln and Jefferson and those other worthies, they're always the greatest teacher in the classroom. They're certainly better than me. Right? And I learn from them right, all the time. And I, I continue to learn from them every single day. And so we, we just right, put the, the great minds of the past in front of the students and, and, and see what develops. Wow. Uh, uh, what is the foundation of the American Republic? Oh, that is a great question. I would go <clears throat> back to the Federalist Papers, mm -hmm. uh, especially what James Madison says uh, in, in Federalist 39 where Madison says, we found all of our political experiments, we base all of our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. That human beings not only should, but they are capable of governing themselves. That human beings are, are capable of self-government. If that's not true, then the entire American experiment is a pipe dream. Abraham Lincoln, by the way, he described the American experiment in, this, in similar terms during the great trial of the Civil War. Going back again to, to Gettysburg, right? He talks of Gettysburg as a, he talks about the war as a test. Um, but he also talks about at the very end that if we lose self-government here, we lose it everywhere, right? That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln and the founders didn't think about this struggle over the question of self-government as one related only to this particular people, Americans. But it's a concern for all peoples, everywhere, at all times throughout the world, that if human beings aren't capable of governing themselves, then only the most ferocious, fiercest kind of despotism would be capable of controlling human beings. Um, but... The founders believed that self-government was possible. If you understood human nature accurately and you could build a constitution and a regime on, on certain basic principles of, of human nature. Um, and, so, so, and every time during any trial or, or test in our history, it's always about trying to live up to those principles in the Declaration of Independence and the possibility of self-government. I mean, any, any great American speech or great right, um, right, era in American history always brings us back to those same questions of self-government and the principles that we claim to believe, that we began as one people by claiming in the Declaration that we hold to, equality, liberty, self-government. These are American principles, yes, but they're also universal ones because they appeal to all mankind. Uh, what does it mean to be free? You're asking hard questions today. I'm trying. This, wow. Uh, <laughs> um, again, I would go back to um, the Declaration of Independence. 
Uh, I would, you know, ask Jefferson. He's got some great letters on this as well. Um, a thinker that Jefferson read a lot was John Locke, right, who also had something to say on this question. So what does it mean to, to be free? Um, freedom or liberty, it certainly doesn't mean doing whatever you want, doing whatever you're strong enough to get away with. That's not liberty. That's, that's license. Um, liberty is possible only under law. Um, for the founders, for Lincoln, for Locke, right, freedom is only possible under, by following what they called the natural law or the higher law or the mm -hmm. eternal law, that standard for judging the human or positive law, um, that there is this higher law from God and nature that determines questions of, of justice and right and wrong. Um, and this law is discernible, the founders believed, through human reason. Human beings can reason. They have this capacity from God to reason, and therefore they have the capacity to think about questions of justice, as opposed to all the other animals in the animal kingdom, right? The lion never considers justice when it's chomping down on the gazelle, no. <laughs> right? But human beings think about justice. Yeah, human beings think about the laws of God and nature, to quote the Declaration of Independence. Freedom is only possible under law, which means then um, either following the natural law through your reason or right, implementing that law in society through positive human law, right? And then right, following, following the law in, in, in that way. But uh, freedom, it's a natural human urge. Um, and as I, I quoted earlier from Ronald Reagan, it's always only one generation away from extinction because Right, freedom because it's founded in reason and based in this higher law. That higher law then needs to be taught to the next generation, because right, we human beings sometimes we need help with understanding justice, the higher things, with working through our reason. Right, so for instance, like the Pythagorean theorem and all those mathematical formulas. When I was in school, I needed a lot of help to understand. Well, why is that reasonable? The same thing is true when it comes to considerations of justice and politics. Right? Human beings, we need to be educated in these principles, and that means right, we need to, to study the past and learn from it and appreciate it uh -huh. uh, in order to right, go forward into the future. Understand. Uh, uh, what are uh, the significant choices, uh, or, or some of the significant choices uh, made by the Founding Fathers? like? You know, yeah. at, at one point, they, someone had to sit down and say, well, uh, First Amendment, let's put in the, the four freedoms mm. uh, or the four rights that yeah. we have. Yeah, uh, that, that's another great question. I'm trying. You, you must do this. Uh, you must be, you must be <laughs> I've done this a couple you of times. You must have done this a few <laughs> times, right? Exactly, yeah, a really good question. Um, so, right, the top choices of the founders, I mean, um, rec recalls the first paragraph of Federalist One about the importance of reflection and choice. The founders said, we don't want to be governed by accident and force. We want to right, choose our own destiny for ourselves. We don't want to have it right, um, made upon us. I would, I would say if I had to pick, th you said three, if I had to pick three, it would be um, the American Revolution, right? Making the decision to actually dissolve the political bands right. with Great Britain. Yeah, you wouldn't have it. You, would, you yeah. wouldn't have America without, without the, the revolution. But the revolution itself, um, John Adams talked about this in a letter to Hezekiah Niles. The American Revolution is not the same thing as the American War. The American Revolution is older than the American War for independence, and in fact predated it. The American Revolution was a turn in the hearts and minds of the American people. And Adam says that goes back even prior to 1776 or 1775, sometime to the 1760s, where Americans became one people, separate and equal and distinct to, to Great Britain. And so I think that that spirit of the revolution that drove the war forward, that was absolutely essential. And that was also right, put into words. It was put into action during the American War, but the American Revolution was put into words in the second great choice of the founders, um, the Declaration of Independence, right, which has always provided what Lincoln called right, a standard maxim right, for judging 
uh, justice. Um, that the, the Declaration of Independence, again, to borrow a Lincolnian phrase, Lincoln called it my ancient faith. Right? If you want to know what makes Americans one people, what Americans believe, what it means to be an American, you got to start with the Declaration of Independence and those right, five self-evident truths that we talked about that we right. began as a people by saying we hold to this. Every generation of Americans have, have to face the question like, do we still hold to these truths? Each generation, we need to write, renew our dedication to those truths. That's, again, part of the reason why education is so important. The third and final choice I'll, I'll say is, um, like the Declaration of Independence, the choice to write and ratify the Constitution of the United States, putting those principles of the Declaration into action. Um, and right, as the Declaration and its principles, right, in a way, um, right, were, were universal, applicable to all men and all people at all places and all times, the Constitution was made for a very specific one people, Americans. Um, and right, knowledge and understanding of that document is absolutely essential uh, right, to understanding the rights and duties of American citizenship. Understand. Uh, what are the funding sources for uh, the Ashbrook uh, Center? Uh, can people make contributions? Yes. So the main funding sources of the Ashbrook Center are tens of thousands of patriots uh, like you and me. The mm -hmm. right, right, you know, the, the founding sources of, of the Ashbrook Center, you know, are, you know, my grandmother, my mother, right? Um, people who are worried about the next generation of American citizens um, who are ignorant of American history and, and, the found, and the founding principles, who are willing to look at all sides of American history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? To understand American history in its truest form, warts and all, and understanding that the purpose of America has always been the struggle to live up to our own principles, right? Sometimes succeeding, oftentimes falling short, um, but always striving to form a more perfect union based on the principles of the Declaration of Independence, right? Individuals who are interested in, in that, right, are interested always in the mission of the Ashbrook Center. And if you want to be one of those people, one of those, one of those patriots to help save the country, uh, please make a donation to the Ashbrook Center. Uh, you can easily find us at ashbrook.org. Okay. Uh, how would someone uh, contact you uh, if uh, they wanted to have a question? or? Uh... Oh, yes, absolutely. You can contact me. Uh, my email address is uh, jsteven, J-S-T-E-V-E-N, two, the number two, at ashland.edu. You can also contact me at jstevens, J-S-T-E-V-E-N-S, at ashbrook.org. Um, or right, you can uh, you can call my my office phone there on on campus. All, all of that information is available uh, on the Ashland University website uh, at ashland.edu. Okay. Well, in, in summary, uh, mm -hmm. what makes sense to you, and and what does? That's a good question. I I, I know that you. I think you end every every uh, interview <laughs> with this question, Rudy. That is uh, that's a great way to think about it. What is making sense to me is the need for making citizens. In this regime, it's not enough that citizens are born, they actually have to be made. Because in a regime founded upon reflection and choice, in a regime founded upon words like the Declaration and the Constitution, in a regime founded upon ideas, those ideas of liberty and equality, they don't get passed down through the bloodstream. They actually have to be taught, which means Teachers, educators, they're in this great and good business of making citizens, of making citizens. Um, and by the way, all of us are in that great pursuit in one way or another. Parents, grandparents, neighbors, and brothers and sisters. That is a responsibility that we cherish, that we take very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. So the need for making citizens, that's what makes sense to me. Um, what doesn't make sense to me sometimes are right, the, the struggles, the conflict that we see today. I think that if you're, you're going to save the country, if you're going to provide a path forward for civil discourse, we have to learn how to talk to each other uh -huh. with respect and dignity again. And I got to tell you, I see that every single day in the Ashbrook classroom. These students, these mm -hmm. teachers, these citizens who are engaged in the mission of the Ashbrook Center, they, gave, they give me such great hope 
for the future of our country. Because although they disagree, they are respectful and civil to each other. We need more of that again. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. And uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you for appearing. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Uh, and thank you for watching. Uh, please uh, uh, send us questions, uh, uh, comments uh, on this show. Uh, you'll see the, uh, uh, the email addresses on, on your uh, bottom of your screen. Uh, uh, if you uh, would like to appear on the show or you know an interesting person that you would uh, like to have on the show, uh, please send us the, uh, their contact information. And remember, uh, seatbelts save lives. The preceding program was presented to you by a community producer. The statements, views, and opinions expressed were not necessarily those of ALC-TV or the City of Avon Lake.